All right, so what we're going to do now is I want to draw for you a diagram of the Windows hypervisor and how that relates to the overall ar uh, operating system architecture. So in a traditional hardware and architecture stack, what we have at the very lowest level, and we have multiple layers that we're dealing with, at the very lowest level, we have our hardware. Things like your CPU, your memory, your hard disk, etc., all at the very, very lowest level. Then above that, we install, we install the kernel of our operating system. So whatever operating system it is that you're running, the kernel is designed to interact directly with our hardware. Okay, so I've installed this operating system on there. The kernel of the operating system has ownership of the actual hardware. So as the kernel takes control of the CPU, the memory, etc., no other system can come along and take control of that hardware. The kernel owns it. So if I run applications, such as my application here, if that's running in memory on my operating system, it is going to connect to the kernel in any, any time that it needs access to the memory of the hard disk or the uh, CPU, anything like that. So if it's a thread or a process that needs to execute, it goes through the kernel, makes a request from the kernel of the operating system. The kernel will in turn go and actually schedule the cycles on the CPU itself or retrieve the memory that it needs, etc. Okay, so every application that I run runs in a unique portion of memory, but it depends on the kernel of the operating system in order to access the hardware that we have. Okay, so this would be a traditional stack. No other operating system can be running at the same time on the hardware because only one of them has ownership at any given time. So now what we want to do is look at how that's different in a virtualized environment. So in the virtualized environment, we still have our hardware at the very lowest level. Okay, again, the RAM, the CPU, the hard disk, the actual physical devices. Now, above that, we are going to slip in what we call a hypervisor. And this is not unique to Microsoft. This is a technology that is used by multiple vendors. It's just that each will have designed their own hypervisor for this functionality. This is a very low level type of software that gets slipped into the CPU below, or at a very low level below the kernel of your operating system. Now, it is going to have ownership of things like the CPU and the RAM. Okay, so if it has ownership, that means all items, the actual CPU is down here at the hardware level, but all calls through the hypervisor to the hardware have to go through that hypervisor. The only way to get to the hardware is through that hypervisor. And it now is going to handle the scheduling and the allocation. So on top of the hypervisor now, we come along and we build our operating systems. Okay, so here is an operating system. Let's call it uh, Windows. Okay, so if I'm running a Windows operating system, it will have access to the CPU, to the memory, to the hard disk, but through the hypervisor in order to get there. Now, primarily the hypervisor is going to have ownership of the CPU and the memory. It is not necessarily going to have complete ownership of the hard disk and certain other hardware resources, but the primary ones that we need the hypervisor to own and control are the CPU and the memory. Now, it depends. That depends on who designed the hypervisor and how the hypervisor was designed. For Microsoft Hyper-V, the primary ownership, the primary hardware that is owned by this hypervisor is CPU and memory. Now we'll get to some of the others in just a moment, but what this allows me to do is to come along and install multiple operating systems on top of this hypervisor. So if each one of these is an operating system, then this can be another Windows OS, this could even be Linux, it doesn't really matter the hypervisor underneath. What matters is that there is a hypervisor and that the operating system that you're running has the ability to interact with that hypervisor. So not every 
operating system, not every flavor of Linux, not, every, not even every Windows operating system can natively interact with this hypervisor. It has to have a component inside of it that understands and can interact with the hypervisor. So Microsoft has a list of all of the supported operating systems. Now that doesn't mean that you can't run flavors of Linux on top of this hypervisor that are not officially supported. They just run in a, in a, in a slightly different fashion. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a moment. Now, an example of a Windows operating system that, that is not natively supported would be Windows NT4. So if you have old Windows NT4 legacy applications, you can migrate them over to a hypervisor type environment and use them, but they will run a little bit slower than one of the native operating systems like uh, Windows Server 2003 or 2008. So as I run these operating systems on here, they are interacting directly with the hypervisor for CPU and memory functions. The hypervisor in turn connects to and schedules the CPU and memory on their behalf. This is what allows us to actually run multiple operating systems at the exact same time. And we're not talking about dual boot, we're not talking about a multi-boot type environment, we're talking about actually executing them at the same time. And that's virtualization. So that's made possible by the hypervisor, we are virtualizing the hardware. Each operating system thinks that it has complete control over that hardware. As far as it knows, it does. It, it will behave as it normally would. Each operating system also has, still inside of it, its own kernel. Right? So if the kernel of its operating system still exists, then applications that are running within each of these guest operating systems need to go through their kernel which will handle its own thread scheduling, et cetera, and they in turn pass things through the hypervisor. So this is what we're dealing with. This is what we call uh, a type one hypervisor. It's a true hypervisor. Now, older systems from Microsoft, such as um, Virtual PC and Virtual uh, Server 2005, are good virtualization engines, but they're not gonna be as fast or as powerful or as flexible as a true type one hypervisor like Hyper-V. Uh, they virtualize at the application layer. So they do, they handle their virtualization up here in this range of, the, uh, of this diagram. Whereas the hypervisor is at a much lower level, tightly coupled with the, with the actual hardware. <clears throat> 